So we're taking up S1, S something today. Uh, I think it's H133. H133, which is a bill that has to do with criminal procedure during a um, hearings. And I'm sure Eric will um, happily go through the bill with us. So if you would, Eric, if you could lead us off. Yes, I'd be happy to. It has to do. Um, I, it has, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you the, the action. It's an act relating to emergency relief from abuse orders and relinquishment of firearms. Yes, thank you, Senator Sears. Uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to uh, walk the committee through the bill that Senator Sears just mentioned, H-133, an act relating to emergency relief from abuse orders and relinquishment of firearms as it uh, passed the House. I think uh, this committee probably recalls that it's dealt with uh, relief from abuse orders, which are known as RFAs, uh, quite a bit off and on over the years, but I think it might help to just refresh the committee's recollection for a moment as to what they are and uh, how they come about. Uh, an RFA, a relief from abuse order, is an order uh, that the court can issue to protect a, a family or household member from abuse by another family or household member. Uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, the way it's obtained is that a, a family or household member can go into court and they file a complaint. Uh, they have an affidavit attached to it. Uh, and if the court finds based on the affidavit and other evidence uh, by a preponderance of the evidence, so it's a preponderance of the evidence standard more likely than not. Uh, if the court finds by that preponderance standard that the, uh, that the plaintiff, you know, the, the house, family or household member, uh, has been abused by the other family or household member in the past, and that there's a danger of future abuse. So it's got to make those two findings, abuse in the past, danger of future abuse, um, by a preponderance of the evidence. If it makes those findings, then it can issue the RFA, the Relief from Abuse Order, in order to protect the plaintiff uh, from further abuse in the future. And that order can contain a variety of things. We'll look at the language in a moment, but it could say, uh, that uh, the person can't have any contact with the plaintiff. They have to remain uh, a certain distance from the plaintiff. Maybe they can't have any contact with the plaintiff's children. They have to move out of the house. There's a variety of things that, that could be in the order. Um, but, uh, but the point is that it restricts uh, the ability, what, the, what the, uh, the defendant can do with respect to the plaintiff. That's the, the big picture of what it does. And the uh, couple of things I think that will be helpful for the committee to keep in mind as we look at the language of the, the bill is that there's two types of uh, RFAs, two types of relief from abuse orders. There's a final order and there's an emergency order. And the structure actually may seem familiar to the committee, not only from looking at RFAs in the past, but the, the ERPO order, the emergency uh, re relief protection orders that committee drafted several years ago were based on this exact same structure. There's a final order and an emergency order. And the way the, the final order works is that um, the defendant has to, there ha the court has to hold a hearing and the defendant has to be present at the hearing. So they have to get notice of the hearing. They have to be present there at the hearing. Uh, and the court can only issue a final order uh, after having had that hearing with the defendant present. And uh, the order can remain in effect for uh, any period specified by the court. In other words, there's no maximum period for the effectiveness of this final relief from abuse order. Could, it's common for them to be a year, but it could be more, some are, some are longer. Um, on the other hand, the emergency relief from abuse order can be issued ex parte. Remember, that means that the defendant does not have to be present. It can be only the plaintiff who, who uh, is present uh, when the motion is filed and when the order is issued. Now, the reason for that, as you can guess from the title of it, is it's called a, an emergency relief from abuse order. Remember, I mentioned that uh, generally the standard is that there has to be the court has to find a danger of uh, future abuse. Um, for an emergency order to issue, there has to be an immediate danger of future abuse. So it's a different, it's a different standard. It has to be immediate. Um, the and the emergency order can only be in effect for fourteen days. So. You've got those distinctions there. Yes, that can be issued ex parte. In other words, without the defendant's presence, 
but can only be last for a maximum of 14 days. And within that 14 day period, the court has to schedule a hearing. And way, the way it ordinarily works is that um, at that hearing, either uh, the plaintiff will then file for the final order, right? Because for the final order situation, the defendant has to be there. So they can file for a, a, a final relief from visa order, which can be for a longer period than 14 days. Or then sometimes they agree there, there are times when it goes away within that 14 day period uh, for whatever reason. But um, if they want it to, if the plaintiff wants it to be in effect any longer, they have to come to that hearing, the defendant has to be there. And then um, if the court makes that preponderance finding that there's a, still a danger of future abuse, then they can issue a final order for a longer period of time. So but they, that, they can do that right now, correct? Eric? Yes, yeah, exactly. That's I'm just so describing the, court the way it can, works. can do this. Um, and and you did. How is this process different than the extreme risk protection order? Yeah. Well, one of the differences is that the uh, extreme risk protection order can only be sought by, I believe, it's a a, a law enforcement officer or the state's attorney. Whereas mm -hmm. in this case, it's a family or household member who typically brings it. Well, I'm looking at the S five is the, um, and particularly in light of what just happened in, Minnesota, in uh, Indianapolis for this mass shooting there, the young man with a history of mental health problems. And um, for some reason they did not, um, the uh, extreme risk protection order wasn't kept. They took a shotgun, I think, but he was able to go out and buy other uh, assault style weapons and then um, so I, um, I'm just wondering um, if we wouldn't be better to consider um, that bill, um, not not obviously not S five, but the process there, and um, consider letting under S five a person um, healthcare um, healthcare provider. Um, reasonably leaves, believes the patient poses an extreme risk causing harm to him or herself or another person by purchasing or possessing firearms, blah, 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 um, would be able to um, uh, file for a petition. So what, what you would do here would be add healthcare provider and would be family member Senator Sears, I thought yeah. we did. I thought we did that in um, a couple years ago when we were talking about the um, the responsibility of a healthcare provider to report an immediate danger from a patient. And um, maybe, Eric can explain <laughs> that we didn't we didn't go that far. Oh, okay. Um, Plus, I don't think it passed. Did it? It didn't uh, pass. The past oh, right. was allowing somebody to go to law enforcement, a family member can go to law enforcement, accept that and um, um, ask for an extreme risk protection order as S5 would allow the healthcare provider to avoid being a HIPAA um, violation if they were to... Um, no, this wasn't around... Um... Uh, extreme risk orders. This was around the Kuligowski um, decision oh, yeah. and, and that required um, healthcare providers, if there was an immediate risk, it required them to um, notify. Yeah, but that, was, that wasn't just firearms though. No, that's true. Okay. All right. I, was, I think that was everything. Okay. If you remember that case, he had... Um, assaulted oh, the yeah. Yeah. plumber with a wrench, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was the danger. It was the danger part. The dangerous, of yeah, the dangerous part of it. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm just looking at that process and this process. So I think there are policy decisions for the committee, but just the one distinction to keep in mind under current law 
is that these relief from abuse orders can be filed by family or household members, while family or household members cannot file for an ERPO. Those are law right. enforcement officers only. I understand. Um, so, but you can certainly make whatever adjustments to either one of those that as a policy matter, you think, think is good policy. Um, so, but I'm trying to understand why we need this bill as it stands. I if will, they can already do it. That's what I'm having a hard time with. Right. I think judges can know, already do this, right? I believe you'll hear from Judge Grierson that it is, uh, uh, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that the, the general practice is that for emergency relief from abuse orders, that some of the forms do include uh, references for firearms relinquishment by the defendant and that it is common practice for, for uh, uh, relinquishment to be ordered in connection with these, but that it, it's not uniform and that it would be helpful to have it in statute. So I think that's their perspective on that, but I'll let, I'll let him uh, testify. That's unusual. Himself. Usually they don't want us to uh, take away some of their independence. Well, uh, that actually would segue me right into the language if you want to take a look at it, Senator Sears, real quick. And uh, well, I, I think- Unless the committee has other questions about my question. No, I just, I have a question. Is an ERPO, ERPA order, is it, only, yeah. is it only able to be filed by a family member or can, can the neighbor next door file it? Remember, Senator Nitka, we're not talking about ERPOs. Were you, did you mean to be asking about ERPOs right then or the order in this bill? Um, These are asking about the current one in place with um, where someone can file for an emergency order. Uh, you, you have, this is an RFA. This is a relief from visa order, not an ERPO. And that's what the, we're looking at in the bill in front of us. And it's only a family or household member can file for it. Okay. So the neighbor can't. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Sure. <clears throat> and family or household member is uh, defined in the statute. So actually, I'm going to pull up the, uh, unless there are other questions. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Eric, how long ago was it we made changes to this statute to enable that to happen? To enable which part? For the judge to be able to remove on the request of a family member. I'm trying to remember. I know Philip wasn't on the committee at the time. Autumn Watersong and Kara Cookson were involved in the conversations. And um, I went around the building trying to get universal approval from everybody based on the fact that we injected due process into the system. And I'm, I'm trying to remember, COVID has me totally stumped on how long ago that was. Well, uh, I, don't th I don't think that one, uh, if you're thinking of the emergency relief from abuse order piece, which a couple of years ago was in a house bill that never did pass the legislature. So the, the current, uh, um, practice of uh, permitting relinquishment or, or ordering relinqu relinquishment of firearms in connection with these emergency relief from abuse orders is based on the court's inherent authority in an emergency and situ situation. It's not based on the statutory language itself. So I think Judge Gerson again can talk about that in more detail, but it's based on the inherent authority of the court to protect litigants during emergency situations. Um, okay as opposed to anything expressed in statute. But I remember Senator Benning, the same same uh, language you're talking about, but that uh, ultimately didn't pass. Okay. Oh. Um, so uh, looking at the language itself, the uh, I'll pull that up real quick. Um, just the sort of ground the committee and um, where we are. And in fact, uh, the uh, first thing I will pull up is the existing statute, just so you can see what we're talking about here. So this is the, the relief from abuse statute currently in Title 15, Domestic Relations Section, uh, uh, Chapter 21, Abuse Prevention. So as you were asking Senator Nitka as to who can bring one of these actions, it's just a family or household member. And, and you see in the definitions right there, definition number two, household member is defined. 
so that obviously family member means someone who's related, but it could also be a household member, which it's, as you say, is defined as a person. I've had a, a, either they've been roommates, shared, a, shared an occupancy, occupancy or dwelling or had a dating or sexual relationship um, would qualify a person as a household member. Um, now, section 1103, this is the final order section that I was talking about. So this is the, the uh, final relief from abuse order that could be in effect for uh, whatever uh, period of time that the court sets specifically in the order. Again, you see in subsection A, it's a family or household member who, who may seek relief from abuse by filing the complaint. Um, and then you'll see under subsection B, this is the final order, court can grant relief only after notice to the defendant in a hearing. So uh, again, this final order requires that the defendant be present for a hearing. Plaintiff has the burden of proving of abuse by a preponderance of the evidence. Now you see under subsection C there, now this is a, the, uh, sorry, the preponderance of the evidence standard is also in subsection B, but under C1, that introductory language, the court shall make such orders as it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the children or both, if it finds, and then there's the findings that, that it has to make. Defendant has abused the plaintiff and either there's a danger of a few further abuse, in other words, in the future, or that the defendant is currently incarcerated for one of those listed offenses. Now, that language that I, that at the very, that first sentence, that first clause of C1, the court shall make such orders as it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the children, they're actually, uh, that's very broad. You see, that that is yeah. uh, essentially giving the court to make any order that it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the children. That language was interpreted in a Vermont Supreme Court case to include uh, the ability to order relinquishment of firearms. So, but this is only in the final order situation, right? So with respect to the final order, that language has been interpreted to permit uh, ordering firearms rel relinquishment, but that same language is not in the emergency order statute. And I think that's another reason to respond to your question, Sanders Sears, as to why it's viewed as uh, necessary uh, to put something in statute specifically, because that, that language is in the final order statute, but not in the emergency order statute. Uh, the, this is the final order language again goes on to list some of the things that that may be included in the order again there's broad discretion that i just mentioned any order to protect safety but could include you know an order that the defendant refrain from abusing plaintiffs or the plaintiff's children in the future uh, b vacate the household uh, c temporarily award parental rights and responsibilities uh, to d the parent child contact can also be in the order um, there's a number of different things and so uh uh, I'm going to move then now, so this is all final order, down to the next section, which is 1104, you see emergency relief. So this is the statute related to the emergency relief from abuse order. And again, under this one, you'll see that it says uh, um, in subsection A that uh, th in this case, contrary to what we just saw, that the order may be issued, this is the second line down under A, may be issued ex parte without notice to the defendant. So in other words, as I said, in this emergency situation, the order can be issued with the plaintiff uh, present, but not the defendant. Um, and this, the, is where, this is where I hear some complaints from people when you know, their clothes have been taken, um, everything is taken out of the apartment that they're both sharing, for example. Am I correct here? I think so, Senator Sears, yeah. So it's, it's not just firearms here. Uh, it, you mean in the bill or, or what could happen? What can happen? Yeah, I think that's right. Yep. But the difference, Eric, as I understand it with the bill is in the final relief from abuse hearing, there is due process because the defendant has received notice. There's been a hearing if there's one that was requested and the judge has made, I shouldn't have said it requested, there will be a final hearing, whether the defendant shows up or not is irrelevant, uh, but the defendant does get notice. And the difference with what this bill is calling for is to enable that property to be removed in the emergency situation where there is no due process for the defendant because they don't even know necessarily that there's something happening at court. Would that be a fair way to synthesize it? Well, 
I, I would agree with you, Senator Benning, to the, ex to, the, to the extent that you're right, that it permits the relinquishment of the firearm without notice to the defendant and without a hearing. Um, but I think that under the due process precedents that uh, there are circumstances under which um, short term brief uh, uh, denials of property can be done what's known as pre hearing. In other words, it's a pre, a pre hearing deprivation of property and, and um, they have to be short, uh, brief and the defendant has to have a reasonable opportunity to be able to uh, contest that at a hearing within a reasonable time afterward. Um, so the only oh. But the initial filing to get there is limited to law enforcement or the state's attorney. Uh, in this case, no, it could be, it still could be the family member or the household member. I, I want to make, I, I'm trying to understand this and I, you completely confused me, Joe. Um, are you talking about firearms or let's say that the individual has tools and things that he or she needs in order to perform their job? They're in construction. Um, yeah, I'm only talking about firearms, Dick. Okay, but I'm, I'm talking about everything. Is there any, can they take everything? No, I don't think so, Senator Sears. If you look at the, so if you look at what the, what can be in this final order, it's listed <clears throat> very specifically in subdivision one there, <clears throat> excuse me, A through D. And that proposal, in fact, in H-133 <clears throat> is to add an E to that. It now says A, B, C, D. That's what can be in this final, uh, sorry, this emergency relief from abuse order. Um, yeah. So currently it's, it's, you can see A, it can either include an order that the, that the defendant refrain from abusing the plaintiff or children or their animals uh, in the future. In other words, don't uh, commit any more abuse in the future. B, refrain oh. from interfering with the plaintiff's personal liberty uh, or the personal liberty of the children. C, refrain from coming into a fixed, coming within, sorry, a fixed distance of the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children, residents, et cetera. So, you know, a certain amount of space that they can't uh, go within in terms of the plaintiff. Or D, D is the no contact order that I mentioned earlier. It can also have a no contact order that can't contact the plaintiff's plaintiff's children, et cetera. Um, so I don't see any, any, anything other than these. In other words, there's no general language in this emergency statute like what we saw. I'm just gonna spin up real quick just so we can compare it to what was in the final order. Remember the final order included uh, right there in the middle of the page C1, the court shall make such orders as it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the children or both. So that's very broad in the final order, but we're only talking about the emergency order situation in which there is not similarly broad language. And, and that may well be, I, I don't know, it's been on the books for a while. It may be that that's because it's more it's narrowly. There, but, but it sounds like if they already can take the firearm, they're already interpreting in 1104, the things that are in the above that you just described in uh, am I, am I my understanding is, is that the taking of the firearm in this situation, the relinquishment under 1104, is not on the basis of that language that we just saw in 1103. It's on the, it's on the basis of the court's constitutional uh, inherent authority to uh, respond to emergency situations. Um, that there, there's not that parallel language in 1104 for emergency orders that there is in 1103 for final orders. So who, who takes the firearms under this plan? Well, they're relinquished. The order, the order. Yeah, but uh, relinquished to whom? That's my question. Yes, that could be. And you, this will track us to, it's interesting, a statute that this committee has worked on a few years ago. You remember, there is a statute on the books in Title 20 that has to right. do with how, how firearms are relinquished. So it could be to a law enforcement officer. It could be to a federally, federally licensed firearms dealer. It could be to a family or household member if the court approves that. You remember that process that, the, yep. that was written. So that, that whole process is, is set up specifically for firearms that are relinquished uh, pursuant to relief from abuse orders. So yep. that's how they, it could be done. So has the person been charged with a crime? No. Well, I should say not necessarily. They might, I, I, they could have been, but not necessarily. 
Well, how did it get to court? Because the plaintiff came in and filed for the relief from abuse order. They filed a motion. Now would be a, probably a good time to look at the new language because you see A, B, C, D, and E, which is what I just went through. So yep. uh, in, oh, sorry. Um, in H133, here we are. So you'll see, this is the language we just looked at. That's existing law, 1104, the emergency situation. Um, ex parte, you know, no notice required as Senator Benning mentioned. And so it can be done without the defendant being present. Uh, we just looked at this as the existing ABCD. And then the bill proposes to add an E that the order may include, in addition to what we just described, the no contact, don't abuse in the future, et cetera, could also include uh, a provision that the defendant immediately relinquish until the expiration of the order, which remember is 14 days maximum. Uh, all firearms that are in the defendant's possession, ownership, or control, and to requaint, sorry, refrain from acquiring or possessing any firearms while the order is in effect. Again, that maximum 14-day period that the order would be in effect. Um, and then if, if the circumstances warranted and the plaintiff wanted to do so, they could try and get the final order at the hearing, uh, which could include firearms uh, relinquishment as well. But as I mentioned, that's already already covered under the existing final order statute. And how does the order how does the order work to um, prevent the person from acquiring any firearms while the order is in effect? And that, this question is, goes back to Indianapolis. Yeah, I think it's a it's a legal obligation on the part of the defendant, and then if the person, uh, but the I, seller, but the seller would have no idea that this person is not on any, you know, if the if the seller, the person walks into a gun shop, decides to buy a firearm, the, the seller would have no idea that this person is on a list, would they? That's a good question, Senator Sears, and I and I. I would want to follow up with Jeff Wallen on that. And it might be a good question for Judge Gerson as well as to whether when the court issues these orders, do they submit the names to the, to the uh, uh, NCIC or, or the NICS database um, that would put someone on that list? I'm not- I don't think there's time. Um, mm. My understanding is it takes quite a bit of time to, I mean, this, I'd love to hear from the witnesses how they prevent somebody from acquiring a firearm during the period of this um, temporary order. May I also ask a question? Sure. So does the, does the court make a decision here about all of these things? So somebody comes in with a, a temper, um, an emergency uh, relief from abuse order asking for it and asks that all the um, firearms be removed and every, all the rest of it. Does the court actually um, just grant it or do they, um, I, I guess my question is how much discretion do they have in terms of of ordering this um, if they suspect that there may be some, that it isn't a legitimate complaint or um, um, it's, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this, but if it isn't, does the court have any discretion in saying, you know, you're right, we need to do this right away um, or, uh, you've been here 20 times before and then you keep dropping it. Does the court have any discretion here? Yeah, I think the answer to that is yes, Senator White. And I think I understand the point you're making. It's that, uh, as you see in uh, uh, lines, uh, well, in their subdivision one there, the okay. order may be granted. So okay. uh, I under my understanding is that based on the facts and circumstances, the court's gonna decide whether or not there's, there's uh, sufficient have been a sufficient showing uh, that there's danger or that these weapons exist or that something supports the order it's it's not just a 
uh, pro forma, in other words. Okay, thanks. That was my question. It's sure. Much better said by you. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear um, anything else, Eric, that you wanted to cover. No, I don't think so. I think that gives kind of the committee the sense of what the proposal is. And then, uh, um, you know, I'm sure witnesses will have helpful testimony as well. Yeah. I, um, I know a lot of times, um, the, you know, we certainly want to keep uh, the victims of domestic violence safe as possible. <clears throat> but I think there's a lot of questions here about how this would actually work in real time and how they would prevent somebody from acquiring. Uh, Senator Nick. Nice Sorry. question also. Uh, um, I, Eric, you said something about the plaintiff could request the final hearing at the same time when they come in for the emergency order. And what, what's the situation with that? I think actually the, the typically the emergency order sets the date right in it for, for the date of the final order. So when they issue the emergency order, it'll say right in the order, here's when the final order is. Um, but uh, my understanding, I think the practitioners will, will know this better, is that, is that there are times when the parties just don't show up for the final order or they drop, uh, sorry, for the final hearing or the case is resolved or, or somehow uh, reached, there's an agreement reached so that the final hearing doesn't always necessarily happen, but that the date for it is set right in the emergency order. So as long as the defendant gets notice, um, then, the, and but doesn't show up, then the whole thing can go forward without the person being there. Is that correct? Which would be the final hearing. As long as they've, they've received actual notice, yes. Yes, they have to, as long as they've been no notified of the hearing, they can choose not to attend, certainly. Okay. And this does not require any crime having been committed or any charge being levied against the defendant, correct? That's correct. This is based on the finding of- This is a whole different matter. Um, had nothing to do with somebody being arrested and charged with um, domestic violence or um, abuse. Right, this is the, the process we have in law that's separate from that, yes. Well, um, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but the judge has to find on the basis of the evidence um, that there has been abuse. Yes. Not, not not a crime not, necessarily. Not, 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 yeah. no, no, but this is all based on a finding, at least a temporary finding, that there has been abuse. Mm -hmm. yes, and there's correct. likely to be immediate abuse again. Right. Both of those are required for this emergency order. Yeah. Past abuse. There was abuse in the past, and there's an immediate danger of further abuse. Mm -hmm. But that is all based on the word of one person. I think be. it's, yes, I think you're right. A lot of that is based on the affidavit and the, the testimony of the uh, plaintiff that the, the judicial officer, you know, asked them questions, that sort of thing. But it may never get to the criminal courts. Yeah, that's that's certainly possible. Yep. So when I hear the opponents of this talk about due process, that's part of what the issue is. is that correct. That's all of what the issue is. But I'm trying to get at Joe is that they could take other things beyond firearms. Well, what they can do right now is limited to what you saw in the emergency order language. I mean, this addition is E. If you take A through D, that's what can be done. Those provisions are all basically designed to protect the um, individual, but they don't require loss of liberty or loss of property. 
Um, and but E brings in loss of property to the equation. But my problem, here's the problem. If they can already do E, why do we need E? And what is the what is to prevent them from taking other items? Eric, if if I uh, if I misspeak here, correct me. My understanding from your walkthrough is they can't do E now during the emergency order, but they can do it during the final order. No. Well, I, I think my understanding is that they are doing E. And when, when I say they, I'm referring to the court putting it in an order and that they're doing it not pursuant to uh, any express language in the statute which is what they are doing with respect to the final order. It's, it's pursuant to that language in the final order that provides broad discretion. So that's what you meant about the distinction between the inherent authority of the court versus the statutory authority. Exactly, exactly. Okay, got it. So you, you were correct then, Dick, my, my mistake. No, they're, they're already doing it. <clears throat> and people are, I mean, in order to prevent it, you would have to, say you can't do it. That, if the opponents of this bill don't want this done, then you would need to switch the language to say you can't do it. But it, this bill means that it's just codifying what is current practice as far as I can understand. Yeah, I think that's right, Senator Sears. I think that's that's uh, one of the uh, ways that it was described in the House. It's codifying current practice. So if you're opposed to this, you would want language that would prevent the court from doing from um, E. Well, and I think also if you're opposed to it, you might say having E in there would suggest to a judge going down this path as opposed to, um, you know, if it's not there, but it's theoretically in, in their ability. So maybe this would make it more common. So right. I could see that objection to it as well. Yeah, but to be best of my knowledge, nobody has challenged the court's authority to do this. Yeah. But should we codify just because it's current practice. Good question. I mean, I, I, from an individual standpoint, an individual can argue that the judge um, has basically crossed a line and then uh, forced the issue to get their weapons back. Here you're saying, no, the legislature has actually endorsed this, uh, which makes that argument all the more difficult. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think we're right on target here. And, but I'm still focused on how they can control somebody from acquiring. I realize they'd be violating a court order, but other than that, what, what can they do? So those are a lot of questions, Judge. Well, and, <laughs> and uh, Sears, uh, Senator Sears, if I could just, yeah point that question. In 2015, we passed legislation that required reporting to the NICS database. And I'm wondering if that piece of legislation covered this situation. I don't know. And, and that's where, but doesn't it take a couple of weeks to get into the database? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm and then sure. it and then takes a period of time to get out. So yeah. if the person, you know, I mean, I, you're, you're talking about banning somebody from acquiring firearms. The, the order has been lifted. There is no order, yet they can't get them because they're in that system, if that's what they do. I don't know. Hopefully, Major Jonas or Jeffrey Wallen can clear that up for us. All right. All right. Should I pull the, pull the language down, Senator Sears? Yeah, please. And um, I think our next witness is... Uh, well, it was supposed to be David Scherr, but I'm going to jump right to Judge Grierson. Hopefully, David won't object. No objection. Thank you, David. 
Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Senator. Uh, and good morning to the committee. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify on this bill. Uh, I've obviously been listening and uh, I think the committee has been asking all the right questions. Uh, for the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, uh, testifying on, I believe it's H133. Um, I, I think one place to start on understanding this bill or the, or the issues around this bill are to understand that there are really three, at least three different um, scenarios that, that a court may be confronted with, all involving similar behavior, but ending up uh, seeking different forms of relief. Um, so take the hypothetical um, partners, domestic partners, husband and wife, spouses, whatever term you want to use. If there is um, domestic violence, physical abuse, as we think of that, the individual, the, the victim can contact the police, report a crime, the police will investigate it that would end up in the criminal court, in, in, the, in the adult court. And as a condition of release, perhaps uh, they would order uh, no possession of firearms. The victim, um, if they are one of the protected uh, family members under an RFA order could separately pursue a relief from abuse order, separate and apart from the criminal case. And that would be uh, plaintiff, spouse versus defendant spouse, completely civil proceeding. And that's why you have a different standard of proof. Uh, but again, as a result of that proceeding, uh, there could be an order of uh, no possession of firearms. That same individual, and by I'm referring to the uh, hypothetical victim spouse, could be concerned about their partner's behavior erratic behavior, uh, mental health issues. <clears throat> and for that reason, seek uh, assistance from law enforcement or state's attorney to obtain a, what has been referred to as the ERPO order. And that would be, again, be a separate proceeding. It follows a similar format to relief from abuse, but it does not involve a crime of domestic violence. Um, and it does not necessarily involve uh, abuse or a threat of abuse towards the victim. Um, and therefore that would be a separate proceeding. And that's why the, the uh, procedures around ERPO orders are uh, different from uh, relief from abuse. There are times and have been times certainly since the introduction of an ERPO order that a person is charged with a crime of domestic violence in adult court, criminal court, the uh, victim spouse seeks a relief from abuse order on their own and the state's attorney and or law enforcement for their own uh, reasons may seek an ERPA order. So there, it doesn't happen very often, but there is sometimes these different proceedings all stemming from the same set of facts. Um, but they are separate and distinct procedures. I, I don't know the Senator Sears any more about the Indianapolis situation than, than perhaps anyone else other than what I had heard was that the prosecutor in that particular case chose not to pursue a final order on the, uh, on the ERPO charge. And that's why there was no order uh, outstanding that prevented this young fellow from obtaining further firearms. But they did cease the shotgun. They, apparently they, they sought it. And again, what I had heard the, the prosecutor say he was afraid and I didn't understand this, but he was afraid if he went to court and lost uh, the the uh, hearing to confiscate to issue a, a final order, if you will, on ERPO, that they would have to return the shotgun. So rather than taking the risk, uh, <coughs> they didn't do anything. So I, I I don't think they I don't know if they returned the shotgun. It doesn't sound like they did, but it, there was nothing of record that would prevent that individual from purchasing further firearms. Um, but to go back to, uh, hopefully that explains the difference between the, the uh, 
three types three of proceedings. Pro yeah, the three process, that's helpful, Judge. Um, so with respect to this order, the committee should have in mind that this, um, Sarah Robinson and her organization, I believe were the um, folks who originated this, or this bill originated in the house uh, with their support. And we were asked uh, to testify and offer comment on it. And the form that you now see it in, I will tell you is, is I'm what I'm- I'm smiling, Judge, about. because I was told that you're the one that sought this change and that no, I, I I was asked to come in and testify at oh, the, okay. the court's view. This was not a, a bill that was initiated by the judiciary. I was asked what I thought of it. And I, as you've heard, and I will confirm that I have- No, that's fine. I, would, I just wanted you to know why I was smiling because I was told that it was something you saw. No, I, 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 we support it in this sense. And yeah. you, the, the committee has indicated this, um, that I believe, and by far the by far the majority of the judges who have uh, responded to me, matter of fact, all the judges who have responded to me, believe they currently have the inherent authority to uh, order this relief uh, at the present time. It is not reflected specifically in statute. Um, and so when I was asked uh, to comment on this bill, I did indicate that I believe we have the inherent authority uh, that this bill, uh, certainly in its present form, um, would essentially, as I think uh, Senator Benning or others said, uh, uh, codify what we now have the authority to do. Um, what I think that codification does, it, it brings some um, uh, consistency um, in terms of, of the judges knowing that they have the authority to do this by statute apart from their inherent authority, but it clearly does not mandate that they do it in every case. Um, the, the bill as it was originally uh, drafted, um, as opposed to the form in which you see it now, I think to a great extent was um, as a result of, of my testimony to suggest that you add this as a section E uh, under the current bill. And the reason for that is if you look at the, prefatory paragraph to A through E, it's still a discretionary act on the part of the court. All, it, all this bill is doing is uh, indicating another form of potential relief if warranted by the facts. And you'll see in paragraph number 1104, uh, small a, paragraph one, upon a finding that there is an immediate danger of further abuse, an order may be granted requiring the defendant and all those items in the current bill, A through D, are, are potential relief the court can grant, but they're not required to grant them in every case, uh, nor would they be required to uh, grant the relief that is set forth in the proposed section E. It, it's just a, a uh, if you will, a recitation of the potential forms of relief. And so for that reason, I, it, I believe that it does clarify uh, authority uh, that we believe we have. Um, and the language that you're, that's in front of you now, uh, it, at least in terms of the uh, placement of it and the wording uh, to a great extent was recommended by me for uh, clarification. So the temporary is is order is issued ex parte without notice to the defendant and there's a finding, or may be issued, I should say, and there's a finding that the defendant has abused the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children involved. That's, the judge needs to find that yes. in order to do anything else, correct? Yes, and, and the, yes, and the key to the temporary order as opposed to the final order is, number one, it's ex parte. Uh, meaning the defendant doesn't have the opportunity at that time. But two, there has to be a finding by the court that th the order is necessary on an ex parte basis uh, because there's an immediate uh, threat of further harm. Uh, Senator uh, White asked about to what extent are these granted or not granted. And just by way of example, um, 2020, I have uh, data shows 
2,200 temporary orders were granted, 743 were denied. Um, and that th those numbers are, are fairly consistent over the years. So no one, no committee member should feel that there's anything automatic about the granting of a temporary order. There are sometimes the orders, they can be denied outright. There's no evidence of abuse or insufficient evidence of abuse. And they're denied, our, even when we deny them, the plaintiff has the right to request uh, a final hearing. Uh, and then there is no order issued, but it is set for a final hearing on their request. Sometimes uh, the order uh, will indicate that there is abuse, but there's not sufficient evidence uh, to show an immediate uh, threat. And therefore the order will be denied, not because there isn't abuse, but because there's no evidence of immediate threat. So this, it is discretionary with the court whether these are uh, ordered uh, and the terms of the orders are discretionary. Um, and the, the uh, relief that's being sought here, as I've indicated, um, essentially is um, this, this would be codifying uh, what we have. When I, when I canvass the judges I, I, on, on issues, whether it's this one or others, I, I never hear from all judges. So I always hesitate to say uh, majority or consensus, um, but I clearly think there's a consensus on, on this issue, but I did not hear from any judges saying we do not have the inherent authority. So it's, it's in that sense, it's a, I, I'm satisfied that uh, this, this is something that we have the authority to do, but at the same time, uh, it, it would uh, indicate that it is a, a form of relief uh, that's available um, along with A through D. Um, <clears throat> Senator Benning. Judge, I have several questions. First, could you repeat those statistics that you had for 2020? Sure. Let me. Um, so, um, 2,200, I'll give you round numbers 2,200 temporary orders granted, a little more than 700 denied. Then you go to the next step, if this helps, uh, the final order. Now remember, the final order hearings can be based on a temporary order that's been granted or the plaintiff seeking a final order, even if they've been denied. So the numbers may not match up. So the final <laughs> orders granted, 1,053 are the numbers that I have. So if you go back to the original numbers, there was about 3,000 uh, requests filed, the 700 plus the 2200, and a final order granted in about a thousand, little more than a thousand of those, and a final order denied. That means um, that could mean either after hearing or uh, plaintiff did not appear. And these numbers don't tell me. Unfortunately, Judge, and I don't know what to do, um, we have. Um, We have a uh, this issue. Um, we are trying to balance 37 things at once here, and this is impossible. And I apologize to you in the middle of your testimony. Sorry. We have to go to a joint meeting of the um, uh, uh, of the House Judiciary at 10 a.m. And we've got like two minutes to get over there. Sorry, I, um, I so can we bring I back. apologize. And we are right. and after this hearing, we are taking up the budgets of the judicial system and state's attorneys and et cetera. So I'm sure you'd prefer we take that up as well. So we're yes. gonna have to delay this testimony till Tuesday morning and lead off with you. Um, That's fine. And continue this. I'm very sorry about this. I, it happens. I really, I, and um, to all of you, um, uh, David and Ing Ingrid and, and all, I apologize to you for, and Sean um, for this. 
but thank you for making the effort to join us. It's been an interesting conversation and I look forward to uh, continuing the discussion. Thank you. But one question, if we could check out beforehand, either having Jeffrey Wallen here or find out exactly what happens when there is a temporary order issue. I, I've written to him as I heard the questions. Okay, yeah, I don't have an answer. An, that's I an important um, question for us. Yeah, I understand. And I, I don't have an answer, but I've written to uh, Jeff while we were while the testimony is going on. I don't have an answer yet, but I'll have one by next Tuesday. Okay, great.